even with reference to people who may be quite knowledgeable in certain areas or many areas of Torah. But they, they are not truly plugged in to the system. In other words, the, the, the underpinning that I just referred to is, is not something that animates them completely, 100%. So it is possible, for example, to to study uh, Torah subjects um, this is particularly possible, but not exclusively so uh, to study Torah subjects in a, an academic environment, and uh, much much has been achieved by a more systematic more uh, scientific approach, shall we say, to studying Torah. But it cannot be denied that s some of these people, in fact, I would say many of the, of the people in, from that milieu, while being knowledgeable and being able to discover certain things and prove certain things, uh, are not the kind of person the Rambam is about to describe for us. And that is a very serious problem. As I think also is the reverse. To have uh, students of Torah who study much Torah but have a very poor and poor understanding of how to uh, get to the bottom of, of uh, various texts, how even to obtain them, and then how to study them, how to analyze them, and what can be gained from such a, a systematic, and, and one might describe it as an academic approach, although the word academic is really uh, purely uh, subjective and even maybe pretentious. The, the Rishonim, all of the Rishonim did exactly the same thing. They, they uh, looked at the various Kidveya, the various manuscripts that they had before them, whether it was of the Mishnah or even of the Tanakh, uh, the Rama with the Hera, Rabbi Meir Halewi, Abu Lafia, for example, is famous for his, his uh, work and his writings on the uh, precise Nusah of the Torah, of the Tanakh. All the Rishonim, Rashi, the Tosafot, the Ramban, Rambam, we can devote an entire uh, shiur to this one day, all dealt with the question of Shinoi Nusha'oth, of the correct readings of the text. No one assumed for one moment that just because you have a text before you that it is necessarily precise and, and correct. Not one of these Hachamim made such an assumption. When they felt there was a problem, uh, and they frequently felt there was uh, something to look into in terms of the text, they looked into it. They compared all the texts they could lay their hands on, and they would tell you, this is the how it should read here, and this, this point in the, in the Sugiyah should read as follows, and not as it might be before you. Rashi does this frequently. He says, this is what, how it should read, and then he tells you how it should read. And he, and he quotes the text to you as, as it should be, because he knew there were other versions extent. And this is true for all the Rishonim and, and the Gionim even deal with such things. And uh, all the Rishonim, without exception. For some strange reason, it became uh, accepted or was assumed from the time of the uh, advent of the printing press that that which is printed before us is simply uh, that's it. That's the text. That's how it is. There's no, nothing to investigate here, and all all discussion is 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 to be based on this text, uh, as if it was a, a certainty that this is how the text should read. When, when of course that makes no sense at all, because any printed version of any text, shall we say, the first printing of the Talmud, well, clearly, it was based on 
one or more kitve yad manuscripts that were before the printers, as they themselves write in their in their own words, in in the introductions to their to their printed versions, or in in other places where they they, they explain what we had before us when we looked into this. And yes, they themselves uh, made their own amendations to the text in in the printing press in the, in the workshop. But that doesn't mean that they had all the manuscripts before them. That mean that means they had certain. They had one, two, three manuscripts before them, but there could have been another thirty. They never saw. Not just could be, without a doubt, there were. So, the the idea that Avodah uh, Chachamim should be naive and um, without uh, intellectual sophistication, that of course is also entirely incorrect. <clears throat> what we therefore strive for is a, a healthy, balanced combination of, of these two things. Intellectual prowess, understanding, of course, tremendous um, effort in studying Torah. <clears throat> I saw recently that uh, a girl, Rabbeinu Shaul Lieberman, wrote to his uncle, the Chazanish, once when he was fairly young, that sometimes I I strive so much and for so long on a certain Sylvia or the texts that are before me, whatever I am learning, I I learn to the point of complete exhaustion that I can that I literally have to I just collapse and, and, and have to lie down. Just there's something I saw recently. That's not that's not new, of course. That is uh, the norm for Tamad Khachami. That that is how it has to be. Otherwise you will not have Tamad Khachami. You have to have that that willingness to exert yourself and push oneself to the limit one has to and one has to have the intellectual capabilities and also one has to have yirat shamayim and and these midot and the entire the world view that is part of a true and authentic part of the true and authentic torah thank you rabbi bar chaim we would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses we would also like to suggest the following opportunity to our viewers if you identify with Rabbi Bar Chaim's message and would like to sponsor or dedicate a video interview with the rabbi in honor or memory of a loved one, if you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org.